Well, some of you may not have expected to hear a message on alien phenomena today. As James T. Kirk said, we will be going where no man has gone before. I'd like to begin by introducing my wife and my son, Carrie and David. Why don't you all stand and wave? I might tell you that David came up with the idea for my most recent book, which will be coming out in about three months. It's on the hard sayings of Jesus. So uh, David helped me with the book, so I'm very proud of that. Now, I need to ask you a question. You know, a lot of people today claim that they're waking up in the middle of the night getting abducted by aliens. That's what they're saying today. Now, I want you to be honest with me. I want to ask you women first. How many of you women have been sound asleep? I mean, you're just very sound asleep, and maybe about 2 o'clock in the morning you hear something. And it scares you. Was that the window that just opened downstairs? And then you wake up your husband. George, go see what that was. How many of you women have done that? Okay, good. Good number of you. Now, men, I want you to be honest. How many of you men have been sleeping soundly? Then you wake up in the middle of the night thinking that you've heard something. And then you wake your wife and say, would you go check that out? How many? Okay, a couple of you. We will be starting a recovery class at this church. See Rich after the service. Now, I wonder how many of you will admit to watching the Twilight Zone back some years ago. Anybody ever watch that show? Okay, good. I feel much better. Do you remember that episode where, uh, you know, uh, these nice aliens show up? I mean, they're just really nice aliens. And uh, these aliens are so nice that they've got this book with them called how to serve man. Now, of course, on the, on the title, it's, it's all alien gibberish, but they translate it for us on the spot. How to serve man. And these aliens, I mean, man, they're just so nice, they've got a book on the subject. And they convince all these earthlings that they're so nice, and by the end of the show, they've invited all these earthlings back to their own planet. And so the TV show portrays all these humans getting on board this ship, and right as the door is shutting... A scholar comes running out of a building. He was just finished translating the book and says, Don't go! Don't go! We've translated it! It's a cookbook! How to serve man. Okay, sick humor, but I laughed. Well, one thing that tells us is that things are not always as they seem. Amen? Things are not always as they seem, and we're going to see that that's especially true regarding alien phenomena. Now, it might interest you to know that as many books have been written on aliens and UFOs as have been written about the Kennedy family. And we all know that the Kennedy family is the gold medallion standard for popularity in publishing. So uh, that means that UFOs are quite popular today. We've also got all kinds of TV shows like Third Rock from the Sun and the X-Files. We've got motion pictures like Close Encounters and more recently Independence Day. We've also got the Roswell phenomena. Just last year there was a celebration, an anniversary celebration, and 40,000 people showed up there in Roswell. UFOs are popular today. And so what we want to do is to step back and take a big look, take a broad look at this UFO alien movement and to try to gain some Christian perspectives on this issue. We want to gain some discernment on this issue, and I think as Christians we do need discernment on this issue. Now, presently, there are many people interested in the search for extraterrestrial life. In fact, there is an organization known as SETI, S-E-T-I, and SETI simply stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And this is an organization searching for extraterrestrial life using radio telescopes. Now, some of you may have seen the movie Contact. That's the movie starring Jodie Foster. And on this movie, or in this movie, you see these radio telescopes pointed into outer space. Now, the movie is fiction, but the radio telescopes are real. In fact, millions and millions of dollars have been spent using radio telescopes listening for signals between 1,000 and 3,000 megahertz. The idea is is that if there, al there are aliens out there, we should be able to discover it by signals that we can hear with these radio telescopes. Now, it used to be that these radio telescopes were funded by the U.S. government, 
But as is true with so many other things, it ended up on the cutting floor of Congress. We ran out of money. So some rich people decided to support this, and among those rich people is Steven Spielberg. Now, Steven Spielberg was at a ceremony where he was donating uh, just an unbelievable amount of money to this project, and somebody asked him, well, Mr. Spielberg, do you really think that there's intelligent life out there? And he pondered for just a moment, and then he said, you know, I think the more important question is, is there intelligent life here on planet Earth? And I think he made a good point. I think he made a good point. We need to have discernment on these kinds of issues. Now, the bottom line so far is that millions of dollars have been spent, but they haven't heard a blip using these very expensive radio telescopes. So far, there's no sign whatsoever of extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, if there is extraterrestrial intelligence out there, the question becomes, why haven't they contacted us? Now, haven't you stayed up late wondering that? Why haven't they contacted us if there is life out there? Well, scientists have been debating this issue back and forth. Now, you'd think that they have better things to do, but they have been debating this thing back and forth. And uh, here are a couple of the hypotheses that they've come up with. One is the self-destruction hypothesis. This is the idea that there are aliens out there, but, uh, you know, they developed the technology of destruction, mass weapons and so forth, and they ended up blowing themselves up before they could contact us. That's the self-destruction hypothesis. There's also the stay-at-home hypothesis, and this is the idea that the aliens are not really interested in contacting us. They'd rather just stay home and contemplate their own existence. And then there is the too-far-away hypothesis. This is the idea that there are aliens out there, but they're just so far away that there's no possible way for them to send a radio signal or a spaceship. You know, all that stuff you see on Star Trek and Warp Drive and so forth, that's all fiction. You really can't do that. So maybe they're just so far away that they can't, can't contact us. Well, I've come up with a fourth hypothesis. It's called the they-ain't-there hypothesis. And it's le at least worth considering. It's a, at least as much worth considering as some of these other hypotheses. Now, I have to tell you that Christians are divided on the issue as to whether there is extraterrestrial life out there. Some say yes, some say no. And I suppose there's room in the family of God for debate on this issue. But I think a key factor has to do with the Genesis account. But before I look at that, let me give you the viewpoints. There are some Christians who think there is life on other planets out there, and among them is Billy Graham. Billy Graham thinks that there probably is life out there, and if there is life out there, they're God's creatures just like we are God's creatures. Now, it's interesting to me that very often when I come across uh, Christian articles or books that argue for extraterrestrial intelligence, the verse that keeps coming up is John 14, verses 1 and 2. And you might want to make note of this. John 14, verses 1 and 2. Let me just read it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now, the key part is, in my Father's house are many rooms. Now, there are so many rooms that there's room for alien believers. That's the argument. I don't think that's a very good argument. I see some of you agreeing with me out there. But nevertheless, this is the argument that is set forth very often. Now, among those Christians who disagree with the idea of extraterrestrial life, uh, it's pointed out very often that when you go to the Genesis account, who did God create first? What was the noblest part of God's creation? Did God create the earth first or all the other planets first? The earth. God created the earth first. And earth remains central throughout the rest of biblical doctrine. Uh, for example, in the future, in the prophetic future, the scriptures tell us that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. When the Redeemer came, where did he come? He came to planet Earth. When he comes again at the second coming, he's coming to planet Earth. So it seems for whatever reason that planet Earth is central in God's plan. 
And uh, even if you still want to believe in extraterrestrial life, you have to admit from a scriptural perspective that earth is central in God's plan. Now, we also learn from scripture that man was created in the image of God. Man is the noblest part of God's creation. But how often do we see TV shows where the aliens are always far more advanced than we puny humans? You see, typically the, the aliens are just far more advanced technologically and in every other way. But the scriptures indicate that man is the noblest part of God's creation. And only man is said to be created in the image of God. So I think that those are some of the kinds of scriptural things that you're going to want to keep in mind when you evaluate the question of whether there's extraterrestrial life out there. Now, I know what you're wondering. You're thinking to yourself, well, Ron, if uh, God didn't plan to populate all those planets out there, why did he create them all? Isn't that what you were thinking? I can see it on your faces. Well, let me give you the answer. The scriptures indicate in Psalm 19 that God created all of it as a testimony to him. You see, all the stars serve to glorify Jesus Christ, the Creator. Now, scientists tell us that if you go outside at night and you look straight up, you can see about 4,000 stars with the unaided eye. Now, of course, here in Southern California, if you go outside and look straight up, you'll see maybe 40 stars at best. But in most parts of the country where there's not such heavy pollution, you can see about 4,000 stars. And with a telescope, with a powerful telescope, you can see a million, billion, billion stars. That's a lot of stars. In fact, scientists tell us that there's more stars out there than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. Now, I don't know how they know that, but that's what they say. That's a lot of stars. Now, I'll tell you something. Jesus Christ created it all. And here's some good news. If you should be in a part of the country where you can see 4,000 stars, and you look straight up one day, and you see all this glory in the sky, well, let me tell you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus Christ is the one who created it, but he is the same one who's preparing the place where you will live forever. John 14 tells us that Christ is preparing the place where you will live. And if you think those stars are incredible, wait till you see heaven. Scripture says that no eye has seen, no mind has conceived, no ear has heard, how great it will be for those who love him. I could get to preaching on that topic, but I'll hold back. It's an exciting topic. But anyway, the stars serve to glorify the creator. Now, I believe that there are three primary explanations for UFO sightings. And I just want to touch on those briefly. Those relate to deliberate hoaxes, natural phenomena, and there is also the occult connection. Now, by deliberate hoaxes, I'm talking about doctored photographs or doctored videos. Some of you have seen some of these photographs. It kind of looks like a flying saucer. But when a computer analysis is done on that photograph, it looks like a string attached to a Frisbee. All right? That's a hoax. I saw a cartoon one time of uh, a flying saucer hovering above a community, and all these people were out there pointing up at the sky and uh, behind these trees were some MIT students with this little control thing they came up with. Well, deliberate hoaxes. There are people out there that get a thrill at pulling hoaxes on people, and they've done the same thing with videos. Uh, so that's part of what explains the UFO phenomena, but I don't want to really spend much time there. I want to spend primary time on natural phenomena and the occultic connection, because this is where we need discernment. Uh, in terms of natural phenomena, let me just give you a brief explanation of that, then I'll talk more about it in just a minute. Uh, there I'm talking about stuff like satellites, or maybe weather balloons, uh, or, or the planet Venus. Uh, planet Venus even shows up during the daytime. You can look up into the sky and see this bright object up there, and some people have called in UFO reports after seeing the planet Venus. This is what I call natural phenomena. And as I say, we will talk about this in more detail shortly. And then third is the occult connection. The occult connection. Now, the fact is, is that out of all the cases of abduction that I have studied, uh, the great majority of them claim to have some kind of a previous involvement in the occult. Now, I wonder, how many of you have read books on abductions? Whitley Strieber, Communion? Okay, a couple of you have. 
I guess it's probably healthier that you not read those books. You might have nightmares. But typically what they say happens is this. These people say that they'll be sleeping right in the middle of the night, and then against their will, they are abducted by these aliens. And these aliens have some kind of a mystical power where you're rendered helpless. You cannot resist. And you're taken up into a spaceship. And while you're up in the spaceship, all kinds of experiments are performed on you. Uh, some people say they are dismembered and then put back together again. Some people say that the aliens sort of do like a piano motion on their bodies, kind of like this. These aliens just go up and down their body, making these kinds of motions. I'm not sure why. And uh, typically, they'll also report what they call a mind scan which sounds kind of scary, and what this is, is allegedly the alien comes very close to your mind, to your brain, and reads your mind, and starts to plant thoughts there, and gives you new revelations, and even gives you new psychic powers, and new occultic powers. Very often people who end up having these experiences go home and discover that they've had new occultic powers develop. I need to tell you right up front, I don't think that they're really being abducted by aliens. By the time I'm through today, you'll understand why I say that. But I need to add that qualification up front just to let you know that I really don't think that they're real, genuine aliens. And I'm going to provide some proof for that. Now, I believe that all three of these categories are necessary for a full-orbed understanding of what UFOs are doing in our society today. Now, when you, when you understand these three primary categories, it's my opinion that that explains the, the majority of the sightings that people are having today. No single category explains everything. But taken together, the three categories go a long way in helping us to understand what's going on out there. Now then, let's look a little bit more at the natural explanations. The natural explanations of UFOs include weather balloons, satellites, Venus, ball lightning, and top secret military jets. Now, if you see something in the sky, there are many possible natural explanations. In fact, when you see something in the sky, the first conclusion you should probably come to is that there is a natural explanation. Now, let me just give you a couple of examples. There's this thing called ball lightning. Ball lightning is a real phenomenon. Ball lightning is not something that Ron Rhodes made up just to stick in his book on UFOs. Ball lightning is something that has been discovered by scientists. And it is a form of lightning that involves not lightning bolts that come out of the sky, but rather this form of lightning is oval in shape. It's red. It's heard to sizzle. It emits electromagnetic energy, which means that it shows up on radar screens. It can hover above the ground, or it can dart around the sky at great speeds, instantly changing direction, going thousands of miles per hour. Because of the electromagnetic energy that is emitted, if it comes near a car, your car will die. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that there are people out there who have seen manifestations of ball lightning, and they've called in UFO reports saying that they've seen aliens. All right, now, this is just one possible natural explanation. Now, of course, from our limited perspective, from our limited scientific understanding, we might see something like that and assume that it must be a spaceship of some sort. But scientists have now discovered that there is a form of lightning called ball lightning that does account for many UFO sightings. Well, how about birds? Do you think that birds could ever account for some of this stuff? In fact, there have been a number of sightings of birds that accounts for some UFO sightings or reports. What I'm referring to is that birds migrate at night. There are certain birds that migrate at night that have been exposed to phosphorus dust. This is dust that glows in the dark. And there have been people who have called in reports of seeing like hundreds of little flying saucers going above their community. And they've ended up discovering that these are just birds that have been exposed to phosphorus dust. So they've got a little bit of a glow. <clears throat> now, some of you are laughing out there, and I'm assuring you that this is actually happening out there. There are people who have actually called in UFO reports after seeing some of this kind of stuff. What about some of the junk in outer space? Did you know that there's over 7,000 objects presently floating around in outer space? 
you heard it here at this church, 7,000 objects. Sometimes it might be just a glove from an astronaut. It might be a screwdriver. It might be a Coke bottle cap or, or, or something else. There's just all kinds of junk floating around planet Earth. And a lot of scientists suggest that if the sun hits any of those objects just in the right way, you might think you're seeing something up there. Okay? What about the military? Is it possible that some of the stuff that we're seeing is military? Well, yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, back in the 50s and 60s, the military was working on hovercrafts. These looked like flying saucers, and they could kind of hover above the ground, and they wobbled a lot. And they were testing these things in the Washington area, and uh, a lot of people called in reports of, uh, of a flying saucer after seeing this thing. Now, it really didn't look very threatening. I mean, this thing was just kind of wobbling along above the ground. The military never did perfect the thing. But back in the 50s and 60s, uh, this is something that accounted for at least some sightings. There have also been uh, military top-secret flights that have uh, uh, involved top-secret military planes. And, of course, the government doesn't want the general public to know about these planes, and so they never broadcast uh, all the stuff that they have. But the fact is, is that just recently, I'm talking in the last couple of years, the CIA has admitted that a tremendous number of the sightings of UFOs back in the 50s and 60s involved top-secret U.S. aircraft that were used to spy on the Russians and other threatening world powers. And, of course, back in those days, the government denied that it knew anything about those things up in the sky because they didn't want to give away any information on these top-secret aircraft. But just recently, the CIA has admitted it. Did you know also that the military has been involved in some holographic experiments? Now, I wonder how many of you have been to Disneyland or Disney World and you've seen some of the holograms, like faces coming out of the wall at you. Anybody seen those things? They look real, don't they? I mean, they're pretty impressive. One of the things that the military has been working on, and this is documented, uh, is the fact that they are trying to work on how to project three-dimensional holographic images into the sky as a form of non-lethal weaponry. The idea being is that if enemy aircraft come into U.S. airspace, they could project these images up there and confuse the enemy, like a bunch of aircraft coming at you or something. Well, some people have seen some of these holographic experiments and called in reports. Now, all I'm trying to tell you at this point is there's all kinds of stuff going on out there that could account for some of the sightings from a natural perspective. There's just an awful lot of stuff going on out there that can account for UFO sightings. Uh, but beyond that, there's also other things that need to be taken into consideration, and that's what I want to focus my attention on now. Now, before dealing with this occultic connection, there's something very important that I must touch on, and that has to do with UFOs in the Bible. Uh, did you know that there's flying saucers and aliens in the Bible? That's what New Agers tell us. And I want to look at a couple of passages with you. The first one is in Exodus 19, and if you have your Bible, you might want to flip open. That's Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. And as you listen to me read this, be thinking about the movie Independence Day. Okay? Now just listen. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Well, it sounds kind of like Independence Day. I mean, you see these clouds coming into the atmosphere and there's a fire within the clouds and as it pulls into New York City I mean all the buildings seem to be trembling because of the tremendous uh, mass of these huge alien spaceships and so today there are new agents who would tell us that uh, what Moses actually saw was an alien spacecraft coming down on Mount Sinai but it was so glorious that he thought it was God okay this is what we are told. Now, I read these books. I want you to know that I've read many books by New Agers on this issue, and they actually believe it. When we hear this kind of stuff, we think it sounds kind of nuts. 
But there are actually people out there who hold to these kinds of ideas. Now, uh, back some years ago, there was a guy by the name of Eric Von Daniken who wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods. You might remember the book. And uh, he held to this theory that Exodus 19 is talking about aliens. And in fact, he went a little bit further with the idea. Not only did Moses see an alien spacecraft, but the aliens gave him a radio transmitter called the Ark of the Covenants. Yep. And you might remember when Moses was at the Red Sea and the Egyptians were attacking from the rear flank. Boy, they needed to cross that Red Sea desperately. How were they going to do it? Well, Moses called the aliens on this Ark of the Covenant radio transmitter. And this alien spacecraft swooped down and then pointed the tailpipe right at the Red Sea and revved up the engines. And it blew a path open in the Red Sea. And then all the Israelites, two million of them, passed. Now, you know, when you think about that theory, there's a major flaw in it, isn't there? I mean, to keep that path open, it, that thing would have to keep that engine revved up and just roast everybody that's, that's going through. I don't think they've thought this thing through too carefully, but this is the theory. Well, there's another passage that I'm sure you've heard of referring to UFOs allegedly, and that's Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, again, you need to think Independence Day as you listen to this passage. Let me read it to you. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. Well, loosely, I suppose that might sound a little bit like Independence Day, but when you go to the context, especially verse 1, which sets the context, it says that Ezekiel was seeing a vision from God. And yes, there are living creatures mentioned, but if you continue reading in Ezekiel, what we are told is that these are angels. These are cherubim angels. These are not aliens. And the revelation that came was from God to the sinful Israelites. It was not revelation from aliens to a New Age civilization. So New Agers are reading something into this text that is simply not there. Now, folks, it gets worse. Once these New Agers get a hold of the New Testament, uh, they come up with all kinds of crazy ideas regarding Jesus Christ. In fact, we are told that an alien intermarried with Mary, and Jesus was half alien. Have you ever wondered why Jesus could walk on water? Have you ever wondered why Jesus could control the weather? Have you ever wondered why Jesus could uh, do all kinds of mir miracles? Well, according to New Agers, he was half alien. And so he had alien powers to be able to do some of this kind of stuff. Now, when Jesus was born, it wasn't a star up in the atmosphere that led the Magi to Jesus. It was an alien spacecraft hovering up in the atmosphere. We are also told that at the baptism, it was not the Holy Spirit that came down upon Jesus. Rather, it was an energy discharge from an alien spacecraft up in the atmosphere. And you remember when Jesus ascended up into heaven? Well, an alien spacecraft came down and picked them up and took them up into heaven. Now again, when we hear this kind of stuff, we think it's wacky. But there are New Agers out there by the hundreds of thousands who actually believe in it. The New Agers also tell us that there's coming a time in the future, in the end times, when there will be a rapture. Now here's what they say. There's coming a time when UFOs are going to swoop down out of the atmosphere and take away 10% of Earth's population. And you know who that's going to be? The troublemakers. You intolerant Christians. You troublemakers will be removed from planet Earth by these aliens, and then you will be re-educated on a new other planet, on a completely different planet. And once you've been re-educated, you'll be brought back to Earth where, when you can enter into a new age society as an enlightened person. All right, this is one of the scenarios that New Agers offer. Now, we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. It doesn't matter whether you're a post-trib or pre-trib or whatever you are. We don't know when it's going to happen. But what's interesting is that whenever it does happen, the New Agers have an explanation in place that will give credit to UFOs drawing attention away from Christ and towards occultic elements that we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, of course, if we read the Bible the way that it's intended to be read, by just letting the Bible speak for itself, we would never come up with this kind of stuff, would we? Well, would we? 
Are you with me? Did anybody say amen? All right. (laughs) If you read the Bible the way it was intended to be understood, you wouldn't get this kind of stuff. For example, the Ark of the Covenant is described in Exodus 25. And you don't see any transistors in there. Okay? What you see is Aaron's rod and covenant stones and a pot of manna. Uh, When you're talking about the Red Sea, this was no little tailpipe. What we're talking about is a huge, huge displacement of water that opened a path for two million Israelites to cross. Folks, we're talking about a major miracle of God. A major miracle of God. In terms of the virgin birth, Jesus wasn't half alien. He was God. God stepped out of eternity into the womb of Mary and was born through her womb. In terms of Jesus' miracles, he wasn't half alien. He did miracles because he was God. Ezekiel did not see aliens. He was giving a vision from God. Now let me just pause and make an observation for you in passing. I'm just going to throw this in for free. You don't have to pay for this one. Of course, you don't have to pay for any of them. We know that Satan wants to deceive us, don't we? Satan wants to deceive us. I wonder, could it be that Satan himself is behind this counterfeit Jesus and this counterfeit rapture and this counterfeit theology that has come out of the UFO movement? Could it be that Satan is using this as a tool of keeping people away from the true Christ of Scripture? I think that that's not only possible, but it's probable. And as I shift my attention to the occult, I think that you will now begin to see that there's even a stronger possibility of that. Now, I'm going to quickly shift to section 7 in your outline. And that is this. New Agers have made a religion out of the UFO phenomenon and through various occultic means are claiming to receive revelations from Space Brothers, including revelations regarding the end times and the UFO rapture. Now, I've just talked to you about the rapture, but let me now talk to you about the revelations. New Agers believe that they are receiving revelations from these people, these these space brothers, aboard UFO spacecraft. And in fact, there are advertisements that you might come across from time to time in New Age magazine where channelers actually advertise saying that they're in contact with aliens and for a mere $400 per hour, they will give you wisdom from aliens on your relationships or your job or whatever else you need insight on. And the fact is, is that when you look at the content of these revelations, one thing that you start to notice is that they are always pro-New Age, pro-occult, but anti-Christian. You see, now that should be a red flag for you. You should start to think to yourself, you know, what's not right about this picture? For example, these revelations will often include the idea that the Bible is not the Word of God. It will often include the idea that Jesus is not God. In fact, Jesus is one of us aliens. Uh, Man is not a sinner. Man does not need redemption from sin. There is no hell. In fact, the aliens tell us that hell is just a a misunderstanding. It was just a big misunderstanding. What they will tell you is that way long ago, some aliens visited planet Earth and they had a picture of Venus. You know, Venus, as you well know, is 700 degrees. It's really hot, flaming inferno. And these ancient people on Earth mistook it for hell. And that's where the idea of hell came from. But hell is not real. And so, since hell is not real, we don't have to worry about needing to be redeemed. And does that raise a red flag in your mind? Does that sound like something that might possibly come from the pit of hell to deceive people away from the true Christ of Scripture? I think so. I think that's exactly what's going on. You need to keep in mind the scriptural background of how great a a, a counterfeit Satan is. As a matter of fact, Augustine once called Satan the ape of God. Do you know why? You go to the zoo, sometimes people do things when they're looking at the apes and they're trying to get them to mimic uh, you in your actions. And sometimes the apes will go along with you and they'll try to copy your behavior. Well, aping is a metaphor. Satan as the ape of God is a copycat of God. And Scripture tells us that Satan has his own church. It's called the synagogue of Satan. Scripture tells us that he has his own ministers of darkness. He has his own doctrines of demons, according to 1 Timothy 4. 
He has his own false prophets. He has his own false Christs. He has another gospel, according to the Apostle Paul. He has his own rapture. You see where I'm going with this? Satan is the ape of God, and I believe that as the ape of God, he may be the one that is behind these counterfeit doctrines that are coming out of the UFO movement. Now let me talk a little bit more about this occultic connection, particularly as related to abduction experiences. Many people who claim to have been abducted by aliens today have a previous involvement in some form of the occult. For example, I think of Mary. This is a person that I studied. Mary was into Zen Buddhism. And she had been practicing Zen Buddhism for some time. And then all of a sudden, one night, uh, she claims that aliens showed up in her bedroom and took her up into this alien spacecraft. And according to Mary's own testimony, uh, she was impregnated by aliens and then re-abducted three months later and the fetus was removed. And this is crazy stuff. This is crazy stuff. But this is what Mary claimed. She has an occultic background and had an experience. And after her experience, she developed new occultic powers and new psychic powers. Or how about John? John was an avid follower of the occultist Carlos Castaneda. Okay, he, he's the one that wrote a lot about the life force, and his uh, book sold millions of copies. And uh, John suddenly found himself being abducted after spending maybe seven or eight years following the writings of Carlos Castaneda. Or how about Fred? Fred was into spiritualism, contact with the dead. Uh, the modern counterpart today is channeling. Fred had been into this for some time when all of a sudden she had this abduction experience. Or I could talk to you about Sally. Uh, Sally studied the paranormal. She studied ghosts and poltergeist phenomena. She studied ESP and she was in all, all of this kind of stuff that has to do with the power of the mind and how to change reality by the power of the mind. Well, Sally ended up having an abduction experience. How about Whitley Strieber? Uh, I bet you some of you read his book, Communion. Anyone? Four. Good. You shouldn't read it. It's not, a, it's not a good book. But it was the number one bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, he was into occultism as well, and he ended up having an abduction experience. Now, I want to read you an excerpt from his book that talks about this. And just listen to this and see if you can sense the darkness in what happened to him. I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there, and yet I couldn't move. I couldn't cry out, and I couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering in her agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy, so dark and sinister. Of course they were demons. They had to be. And they were here and I couldn't get away. I couldn't save my poor family and I still remember that thing crouching there. So terribly ugly. Its arms and legs like limbs of a great insect. Its eyes just glaring at me. Later, he referred to these alien intruders as soul eaters. Soul Predators. Can you sense the demonic here? Can you sense the darkness in these kinds of encounters? Now, people watch the X-Files and they think it's a great thing. But you know, a lot of people don't recognize that in many, many cases there is an occultic connection that is absolutely horrible. Now, start putting two and two together. Typically, it is people involved in the occult that get abducted. And people who experience these things typically develop new psychic powers and new occultic powers. And very often, uh, there are revelations that come from these alien entities that are anti-Christian and pro-New Age. Not only that, we are consistently given counterfeit reinterpretations of Scripture. We are given a counterfeit way of salvation, a counterfeit Jesus, a counterfeit rapture, and the counterfeits just continue. You start putting all this data together and you can start to sense an evil intention here. I personally am convinced that in many cases, a lot of what these people are experiencing, these people who have been involved in the occult, is in fact demonic in nature. 
And that's what my conclusion is. If you look at point number nine, we must conclude that while many UFO sightings are rooted in natural phenomena, there is also an occultic element in the New Age movement that accounts for some of the strange alien experiences people are having. And the presence of the demonic seems very, very clear. Uh, there's a couple of other points related to this that I want to make to you. And to begin with, uh, these aliens, these ones that are involved with uh, New Agers, so to speak, you can't contact them with radios. Uh, you can only contact them with seances or out-of-body experiences. You know, we talked about occultism earlier today. You can't contact these aliens with natural means like radios. You can only contact them by occultic means. Not only that, but there's a secular scientist by the name of Jacques Vallée. Some of you may have actually heard about him. Uh, has anybody seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg's movie? Oh, come on, more of you saw it. How many? Okay, good. That's a movie that uh, probably most of the world has seen, and you might remember a French scientist in this movie. And this French scientist is actually based upon a real-life person, and the real-life person is Jacques Vallée. Now, Jacques Vallée has studied over a thousand specific UFO sightings, and he's actually talked to every one of these people individually. He's gone to Russia, he's gone to Europe, he's gone to the United States, and just about everywhere else, talking to people about these encounters. And here's something very significant that he discovered. He discovered that these entities, these sightings, whatever they are, do not seem to be coming from outer space. Rather, he says, based upon the eyewitness testimony that he has accumulated, these things seem to be coming from a dimension all around us. They seem to appear from a realm around us, and then after appearing for a short time, they often seem to disappear back into that same realm. Now, Jacques Vallée is not a Christian. He is not a Christian. He does not have a Christian worldview. But I think that his discovery, his finding, is significant for the Christian worldview because we as Christians do believe that there is a realm around us which is a spiritual realm. And we do believe that Satan operates from that spiritual realm. And in fact, the scriptures indicate to us that Satan has the power to do lying wonders and lying miracles. There are always miracles designed to deceive people. He wants to keep people away from the true Christ of Scripture. And I think that what Jacques Vallée has discovered basically puts an exclamation point on the fact that there, there is this demonic element here. Now, do you remember the book Chariots of the Gods with Eric Von Doniken that I mentioned just a few moments ago? Well, I did some digging on this guy. He's this guy that talked about how the Ark of the Covenant was a radio transmitter used by Moses. I did some digging, and even though it's not commonly known, even though most people are unaware of this, I discovered that, in fact, this guy was involved in the occult. In fact, if you read some stuff that he wrote many, many years ago, you will discover that he claims to have been involved in out-of-body experiences, which is something pretty typical among those involved in the occult. This is the idea that your spirit actually leaves your body and can go around into outer space and even talk to aliens aboard spacecrafts out there. So I believe that where Eric Von Doniken is coming from is an occultic worldview. And in fact, the, the source of some of the ideas that he set forth in his book that sold 54 million copies came from the powers of darkness. What can we conclude? What can I leave with you today as I close? Well, there's a verse I want you to mark down, and that's 1 John 4.1. 1 John 4.1. This verse tells us, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, what happens when we test the spirits in regard to these aliens? What do we discover? Well, for one thing, the aliens never say anything that affirms the Bible. They never say anything that glorifies the person of Jesus Christ. They deny man's sin problem and the need for redemption. They deny that Christ did anything for man's salvation, but say that Christ was one of them. They offer a counterfeit salvation and a counterfeit rapture. 
Typically, it's people involved in the occult that have these experiences, and these people end up with new psychic powers. Now, are you starting to get the picture here? When you test the spirits, the aliens fail the test. The aliens fail the test. And so what I want to do is just leave you five small, short tidbits of advice. These are tidbits of discernment. They're not long. We'll be done in just a couple of minutes. But they're just five tidbits of advice that you can mark down in terms of discernment. Number one, you should follow the Apostle Paul's seminary degree. You don't have to have formal training in apologetics to be able to witness to these people. But by being aware of some of the stuff that we've talked about today, God might bless you with the opportunity to lead one of these people in the New Age movement to the true Jesus, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if they do join the kingdom of light, they will witness the real second coming of Christ, which every eye will see. God bless you.